Welcome back to Math for Game Developers, and this week we're going to finish up our our little mini series in optimization. Remember, uh, in the previous two videos, previous two weeks, we learned about different ways that it's possible to stall the processor while it's executing our program. And the first uh, the, of of those ways was if it's if it has a cache miss, which means it it is waiting for memory to come up to the highest cache levels. And the second way that we can sell the processor is if we uh, is if we have a branch misprediction, which is that the processor guessed incorrectly at what we're, at what it's trying to at what the intention of the programmer is. Like if we have a conditional if statement and it guesses incorrectly about the result of that if statement, and that can cause a significant breakdown in, in the performance of the program. So we haven't really learned anything, I think, if we don't change our behavior somehow, if we don't uh, change the way that we write our games, our programs, to account for this, this, this uh, processor architecture and its properties. So let's this week look at a way to um, structure our programs that takes advantage of the properties of processors. So. Let's say we have a, we have a struct of, of entities in our game. So again, an entity is just any object in the game, be it a player or a monster or a box or whatever. And every entity is going to have some properties. It's going to have a three-dimensional vector representing the position, a one representing the velocity. Maybe we have an integer. That's the status. I'm not writing out the full names of these just for brevity. We might have a string that is the name of the object and, and so on. Okay, so we have a big structure with all of the, with all of the data corresponding to this entity in that structure. And then at some other point in the program, here's a dividing line, we're going to say, give me a list of these entities, okay, and we're gonna make a thousand of them. Okay, so now E is just a list of a thousand entities. And there's a name for doing it this way. This is called a structure, no, that's not right an array of structures. Okay, so I have an array here, and each item in my array is this structure. So now let's look at how the memory of, of, this, of this array of structures is laid out. So here's the memory, okay. I draw that straight. And then so we're going to have for the first item, for the first item we're gonna have a uh, position and then a velocity, and then, a, and then a status, and then a name, and so on, okay. And then for the second entity, we're gonna have a position, and then a velocity, and then a status, and then a name, and so on. So this right here is the data for the first entity, and this here is the data for the second entity and, and so on. Now let's say we want to do uh, our typical, just like we did in the previous video, a, a, a game loop where we update the, the, the position, the new position is equal to the position times, I'm sorry, plus the velocity times the change in time, right? This is our time step, our basic time step for our, our game. Um, well, when we when the processor sees that we need the position of, of this entity, we need the velocity of this entity, then it goes into the memory and it sees, well, I'm going to, here's my position, my velocity right here, so I'm going to grab all of this stuff and pull it into the, into the L1 cache, into the L1 cache so that the processor can use it. But look what we've done. This is the this is the only stuff we need right here that I'm outlining in purple. This is all we need, but we've managed to pull in all of this extra stuff along uh, along with it. And remember a cache line is 64 bytes. So we we only need 24 of these bytes and I get 24 because that's that's a floating point number is 4 bytes. 
and there are three of them in a three-dimensional vector, and I have two of these vectors. So that's three times four times three is 24. So we need 24 bytes, but we pull 64 bytes in. So we've wasted 40 bytes of this cache line. We're, and we're assuming that the entity is large enough that, um, that, it's, that it's not, that it, it spans multiple cache lines here, okay? Which is most likely the case. So that's kind of wasteful. What if there were some way we could redo this structure right here such that it um, such that when we pull in our cache line, we don't waste that 40 bytes. We pull in only things that we're going to calculate with. So here's how we do that. We're going to draw another dividing line right here. And we're going to write another struct. This time we're going to call it ents. And we're still going to do a three-dimensional vector of positions, but this time we're going to put all of our positions together. Again, we have a thousand entities. And so we're just gonna put all 1,000 positions together. And then we're gonna do the same thing for the velocities. We're gonna put all 1,000 velocities together and so on, okay? And then we only have to make uh, here's my dividing line, okay? When we go to instantiate this guy, we're only having to do, call it E2 to separate it from that. We only make one of them because it has all of the information we need inside of it. There are a thousand positions and a thousand velocities in there already, okay? And then now let's look at how the data is laid out in memory okay now we have a thousand positions all contiguous in memory and then we have a thousand velocities velocity 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 all contiguous in memory and then we have a thousand statuses all contiguous in memory so this is kind of weird because when we want the first entity, okay, we have to look for it in a, in a bunch of different places. Here's the position of it, here's the velocity of it, here's the status of it, and so on. Um, so this, this maybe is, seems sort of convoluted that we're taking our entity and we're scattering it all over the memory. But now, look what happens when we do this time step. Okay, we're gonna load in we're gonna load in 64 bytes into the L1 cache, but we just get a bunch of positions. We get only positions, which is great because we're gonna do the position for, for the first entity and then we're gonna move on to the second entity and the position for that entity is right there in the cache line already. And then the position for the next entity is still in the cache line and so on. Um, and same thing for velocities, we're gonna load in, we're gonna load in 64 bytes worth of velocities into L1, and we're gonna have a bunch of extra velocities already there in memory. So we can do a bunch more work for every cache line that we load in. So that's already a huge savings by doing it this way. And this way also has a name. It is called Structure of Arrays, SOA. Uh, so this is the first advantage for doing it this way. We use the entire cache line that we pull into memory, all 64 bytes. The second way that, so actually let me write that. There are three advantages of doing this, okay? Three advantages, okay? One is we use the whole cache line. Two is the processor now sees that we're using one cache line after another. We're, use, we're using the first bunch of positions and then the second bunch of positions and the third. These are all contiguous cache lines. They're the first and then the second and the third cache lines. And so it recognizes that we are going to need the next cache line very soon. And so it actually pulls that into the L1 cache for us before we're even gonna need it preemptively. And that is called hardware prefetching hardware prefetching. The processor predicts that we're going to need the next 
bit of memory and it pulls it into the L1 cache for us before we're gonna need it so that we don't have to do that stall. And so already we have a huge performance gain, one from using the whole cache line and two from using hardware prefetching. And then the last uh, advantage that you get from, from doing it this way is that it makes SIMD very easy. SIMD, and what is SIMD? It's single instruction, multiple data, multiple data. Uh, data, I can spell data. So what does that mean? That means a single instruction will operate over many elements of many floating point numbers at the same time. And the processor can do this because it actually has four execution units. I'm going to write that word down. Okay. One execution unit is a series of circuits in the processor that does a floating point multiplication or addition or division or, or whatever option, you know. And uh, the way we usually think about it is that it has a multiplication execution unit and then it just applies that to each, each, you know, at each entry in your data one at a time. But actually it has four, it has four. And so it can do the operations for four different floating point numbers in parallel, okay, all at the same time, which means it can do it four times faster than it could otherwise. Now, I'm, I don't want to cover like exactly how to use uh, SIMD because uh, the syntax is completely new and, and, and a little bit more complicated than I want to get into for this video. But the advantage of doing it this way is that it makes it very easy to implement and to, and to get all of the um, performance increase out of SIMD. You don't need it to get performance increase out of doing SOA, structure of arrays, but it makes it very easy to go that extra step and get the additional performance from it. Okay, um, so that about wraps up programming program optimization and Really quick before I finish, I want to thank both Mike Acton and Andreas Fredrickson because uh, a lot of in a lot of their talks they use some examples that basically inspired the demos that I was doing. And actually, I would say that without Mike Acton spearheading this whole data-oriented design thing, I probably wouldn't have done this this little series on optimization in the first place. So thank you to both of them. Next week uh, we are going to be doing some some catch-up videos for some requests that I've had for, for things that I've missed before and I want to go back and flesh out a little bit more. And then after that I'm going to be getting into numerical analysis which is great fun and very applicable to video games and I think we're gonna have a good time doing that. So see you guys next week.